Hi, welcome to Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and thanks for watching. Well, the legislature is gone, but the issues of health care remain. We're going to do our monthly health care update and the financial literacy update following these words. This is Pennsylvania Newsmakers, a fast-paced, unrehearsed weekly discussion with and about the leaders who shape your world. And now, here's your host, Terry Madonna. Welcome back to Pennsylvania Newsmakers. Well, the legislature did a bunch of uh, important uh, bills uh, as it ended its session in July. Uh, the legislature is on recess until the fall. Uh, we're going to uh, take a look at, at, at two or three of the big issues the legislature dealt with or failed to deal with, as the case might be. Joining me in this part of the program is Dr. Mark Piazio. He is the president of the Pennsylvania Medical Society, often on the program. Doctor, welcome. Hey, thanks so much for having me again. It's nice All to be right. back. Well, it's great to have you. All right, we got, uh, let, let's get through some of these. I mean, we have this problem of the medical, of the uh, coverage, liability coverage that doctors are required to buy. It's expensive. There's a kind of a Medigap program. Medigap program the uh, state provides called MCare. It's important because it's necessary to keep physicians in the state and attracting new ones. But there's some problems with that. Talk about that a bit. Right. It's obviously a very complicated issue, but uh, back in the 70s when liability crises seemed to occur, as they do every 20 or so years when we can't find insurance, the state got into the, got into the business and, and developed the CAT fund. And over time, the CAT fund has developed a significant unfunded liability, 2 to $3 billion, that the state and physicians would like to get out of. To mm -hmm. do that, we've got to transfer that risk into the private market. Well, as those markets hardened, fewer and fewer insurers were willing to come to the state. So we ran into this problem about 10 years ago. In 96-97, uh, Act 135 has tried to phase out that CAT fund. And then in 2002, the government stepped in and offered some supplemental state money to help, help physicians and high-risk specialties to pay that, that amount of the fund as we phased it out and had to buy additional insurance in the private marketplace. Well, by now, we were hoping that that would be phased out. We have had some encouraging... Uh, things go on in the marketplace. Suits are down. The number of suits are down. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems that the cat fund money is coming down a little bit as well. However, judgments still remain very high and total dollars out right. still remains high. So let me so, get this straight. Let me get this straight. This is the coverage that the state provides. It's at somewhere between 500000 and a million. Right now it's at, it's at 500000 We'd like to reduce it to two fifty and then okay. eventually eliminate it. And the governor's uh, uh, budget secretary, we did have a, a, a process to do that. But it would require us having to buy more insurance in the private marketplace now. And the insurance department... And that's one of the things that keeps, will retard our ability to keep doctors in the state, particularly it's, young it, doctors. It would be hard to recruit because they've got to not only pay their current million dollar policy, but also pay off the old one that's still sitting out there unfunded. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to avoid. To do that, we've got to shift to the private marketplace. But it looks like that the private marketplace doesn't have the capacity right. to do that. And we've been trying for 10 years for that to occur, and, and it still for, hasn't. And for a period of time, private insurers were even reluctant to insure doctors in the state because of the medical liability problem. Is that correct? It's yes, that is. And it still appears to be a problem, at least amongst traditional insurers. What we found was that the insurance market, though it's more robust in terms of players, the majority of the players are what are called risk retention groups, which don't have the same risk-based right. capital that... The standard insurers do, making it a little a little more worrisome long term. All right, we're talking with Dr. Mark Piazio from the Pennsylvania Medical Society. We'll be back after these words. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry, the statewide voice of business. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by Pennsylvania Medical Society, doctors and patients, preserve the relationship. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association, business in Pennsylvania is our business. I welcome back with Dr. Mark Piazio. He's the president of Pennsylvania Medical Society. We're talking about some aspects of the what the legislature did uh, or didn't do, as the case might be. We're going to turn to another subject matter, and this uh, was a pretty hotly debated uh, issue in the legislature before it adjourned for the summer, it took its summer recess, and that has to do with this whole scope of practice issue. It's something uh, that has to do with what folks who are important in the, in the medical community can and cannot do in their practice of their professions. Talk a little bit about that. 
certainly in trying to improve access to health care, particularly primary care, uh, one, one solution is to increase the scope of practice of allied providers who don't have the same training as physicians but have, uh, do have some clinical training and getting them more into the marketplace and getting them uh, more able to do the things that they're trained to do. The difficult part of that, of course, is, is always is, you know, when, when the two scopes interface, where is the real line? Yeah. Where do you have the, what separates what someone can do and what they shouldn't? So that was where a lot of the work came in in trying to find the balance or the line of where that should be. And we think that in, the, in these bills we've probably gotten as close to that as, as we can. Mm -hmm. We are hoping that, that, uh, that uh, these statutes will stay as such because there's also a regulatory process which can change all that and yeah. alter, the, alter that field as well. But, we do think that as we go forward, having expanded the scope of, uh, of uh, nurse midwives and some nurse practitioners and clinical nurse specialists, that we study it carefully over the next several years. Reason being, we do know that as we increase access, we've never really been able to decrease cost. It actually fuels cost. And as you increase cost and expense, as we've seen from yeah. mergers and like, you lose the ability to buy insurance and you lose access. Yeah. So there's a very intricate balance between those things. And somewhere in there is the quality and safety yeah. that we really want to make sure that as we do expand the ability of uh, physician extenders or allied health providers to work in the marketplace that we do it in a safe, responsible, and uh, an economic yeah, way. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, this is kind of an interesting dilemma. I mean, the, go the governor, when he came on this program, you know, talked a bit about this, and he made the argument that there's no reasons, no reason why we shouldn't have clinics like in Walmart and other places where folks could com come in and get treatment for things that may not require a doctor. Is that what you mean when we have to make sure that while we're doing that, we don't, in, you know, a put people in danger. We don't get ourselves into a situation where there, people don't get the appropriate care. I mean, is that in concrete terms? Sure. One of, it, you know, one of the ways we we look at that, we say well, we have so many people in the emergency rooms that don't have true emergencies. Well, how many people that have emergencies are going to end up at Walmart? Yeah. Uh, the the patient generally doesn't always know what exactly their symptom complex is and what level of care it may require. And we we want to make sure that we don't develop these these. Uh, these clinics, particularly where there is, there may be some secondary gain with yeah. on-site pharmacy and the like, you know, increase cost and maybe not be the the quality or have that that uh, informational consistency where that patient's health care is going to be monitored on a continuum and not just episodic yeah. treatments for for symptoms and end up uh, not looking at overall pictures of health. Yeah, so it's going to be a challenge. They are uh, they are present. They are market they are market answers right. to uh, question market is questions. Whether the quality and the uh, and the safeguards are there to protect uh, the, the, you know, the right. folks, right? Right. The data is not really in that much. These are new entities, and uh, which is why we'd like to make sure that when we make some changes to statute, that we don't make a lot of changes, right. so we can make sure that we study carefully what we did. All right. Thanks, Dr. Piazio. Thanks Coming up, hospital-acquired infections. Another one of those issues that the governor and the legislature dealt with. Uh, we we'll deal with that subject matter after these words. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by Pennsylvania Credit Union Association. Pennsylvania Credit Unions, where people are worth more than money. To find a credit union that is right for you, check out ibelong.org. And by the Energy Association of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's energy information source. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the state system of higher education. 14 state-owned universities. The state system is the largest provider of higher education in Pennsylvania. And by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania. Working towards a healthy Pennsylvania. Hi, joining me is Melissa Speck from the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania. She's Director of Policy Development and I'm going to get heck. I can say heck. I, I said hospital acquired infections, but in reality, uh, the activity in the legislature actually dealt with the entire health care system. Is that not correct? That is correct. Talk a little bit about I mean, I think that's important to get out because everybody refers to hospital, but it's, it's, the, it broadly encompasses many more. Go ahead. Absolutely, Terry. Um, Really, I think I think the best term is healthcare associated infection, and, okay. and in fact, that's what the legislation that recently passed represents and reflects. And and that is because it truly is not only healthcare as in the healthcare settings, so hospitals, nursing homes, ambulatory surgical facilities, those kinds of places, the different different settings in which people seek care, but. 
There's also, it's a community problem. It's a public right. health community problem that, that requires very comprehensive approach to taking and starting to combat the infections. And I think the legislation that passed is a really good first step at doing that. All right, let's get into, I mean, I think this is an important subject. It got a lot of press, you know, leading up to the passage in, you know, in that budget session that went on interminably 16 days, I think, after the June 30 deadline. We don't care about that at the moment, but we do care about what is in that legislation that you all should care about and how it's going to help ensure, you know, you know, a better patient safety in all of these facilities, not just in the hospitals around the state. So go through some of the important elements in it. Well, I'd say that, that one of the most significant elements is that this bill requires that facilities, and, and in, in this particular instance, the hospitals, are going to be reporting to a national system um, that was created by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and they're going to be reporting using clinical definitions and criteria so that there will be uniformity around what is a healthcare-associated infection, mm -hmm. and it will allow us not only within our own facilities, but within our own state and then outside of our state yeah. to start to compare how we're doing at reducing those infections. And by taking and developing a uniform system, um, the hospitals will be able to concentrate their efforts, which includes their resources, to ensure that they're focusing on those truly sentinel infections yeah. that one deserve of, attention. One, one of the questions that I always had, uh, and I, I, I've not gotten a good answer to this, is how do you know where you got the infection? I mean, it seemed to me that you could come into, you know, a doctor's office or you come into a hospital, you come into some clinic somewhere, you could already have an infection. You might then be moved to another place, you know, go to another place to get further treatment and yet another place. And where do you get, to, I mean, can we know with certainty where, we can know you may have it, mm -hmm. but how do we know where you got it? That's, that's exactly <laughs> why I think the misnomer of it being a hospital yeah. acquired infection is so important because in fact, statistically, you have a lot of nursing home residents that are transferred to a hospital and are admitted for inpatient care, yet they're already yeah. carrying some form of an infection, be it the, the, the superbug MRSA or say a, a urinary tract infection that had been undetected, they come in, they have a medically complex case, and that infection manifests mm. itself. So the perception is that it was acquired in the hospital because it manifested during that hospital stay. Mm. But in fact, it may not have. And honestly, in a room of five, seven people, at least two of them could already be colonized with that superbug sure. MRSA. Sure. But not be symptomatic because they're not they're not ill and, and there's no signs of it. But they're they're already colized with that that bug, if you yeah. will. What is in the, what else is in the act? What else is in the act? Um, I, I think it's also important to to recognize that um, the bill requires hospitals, nursing homes, and ambulatory surgical facilities to take and build into their infection control plans within their facilities some key things, um, the least of which is the ability to start screening. Hospitals will now have to screen all nursing home patients that come in for admission um, for inpatient services will begin screening them for MRSA and other multi-drug resistant well, that might be, I mean, uh, that's certainly a good idea, but who's going to pay for this? Uh, the law also takes care of that and says yeah. that, that sc those screenings and cultures will be considered a reimbursable cost by the health payers. And, and that was one of the issues. I mean, if you want to increase the testing and the uh, other procedures that get done, some, you know, who's, who's going to pay for that? Absolutely. Um, you know, care isn't free, and we've got to be able to yeah. invest in it to ensure that we're doing, we, re we receive the benefits on the back end. Um, other components of the law, you, you had just talked about the transferring um, of patients and how they go from one care setting to another. Right. There's a notification provision within the law that says that say a nursing home knows of a resident that, it, that is already infected, right. um, they have to notify the hospital and vice versa. So we'll be able to start some communication lines that'll help to allow it. All right, before we let you go, all in all, uh, is this a reasonable approach to solve the problem or, or, or to work on solving the problem, maybe a better way to put it? I, I think it is a wonderful, logical next step. You know, Pennsylvania has already been yeah. a leader in addressing healthcare associated infections. Hospitals have been doing a lot of work and, and certainly want to be combating it and this is the next yeah. logical step. And I noticed in the debate as it ended, I mean, there seemed to be a, a consensus that emerged about this. So everybody seemed reasonably happy. This is a good step. I, I think, um, you know, the stakeholders that were involved yeah. in this went through a, a really um, wonderful collaborative process to get to get to the point where we had this compromise right. bill. Great, great update. Thanks for coming in. Financial literacy update after these words. We'll see you back in the newsmakers in a moment.
This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by Highmark Blue Shield, changing the way health plans work for business with a variety of plan options for employers and more choices for employees. Information is available at Highmark.com. Have a greater hand in your company's health. And by the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association, the future of long-term care. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Builders Association, building today for a better tomorrow. And by the Pennsylvania Cyber Charter School, bringing educational innovation and freedom to the children of Pennsylvania. Hi, welcome back to the program. It's financial literacy update time with David Keffer. He's the CEO of Cornerstone Federal Credit Union and Rick Wargo, who's the general counsel with the Pennsylvania Credit Union Association. I'm doing that quickly. We've got a lot we want to get done. Uh, David, I want to start with you. I want to talk a little bit at first about identity theft. We dealt with this on a number of occasions. Uh, is there anything new that you can tell our listeners about, uh, viewers, uh, what they should be watching for and how they should deal with this growing problem? With uh, the identity theft, uh, there are some things that they should look for all the time. Um, the credit cards... Uh, uh, if you don't receive your statement on time uh, coming uh, or your financial institution, what's happening is the, their information is being taken. Um, they may be changing the address so mm. that the information that should be sent to them is being sent to some other place so that they can do things against the account that uh, yeah. would cause problems. Huh. So now hold on. So what you're saying is maybe we should monitor when we're supposed. Boy, is this interesting. Now we got to watch when we get a bill. We usually mm -hmm. we we said we don't want the bill. Now you're saying, pay attention to the dates. If it's a little late, go find out what happened to it. Exactly. Yeah, you should be on the phone right away, uh, calling your institution, uh, calling the credit card number, find out uh, where it is. You know you had charges. Uh, you may not get a bill on a month that you don't have charges, but if you know you had charges, uh, you should be on the line and, and finding out where that is. That's, Boy, that is an interesting yeah. insight. Go ahead. Do you have another one? Um, yeah, I think uh, if you're denied credit, uh, you may uh, oh. have applied for credit, you get denied credit, uh, that's uh, a sign, especially if you have no reason to is, uh, expect that you would be denied for, for credit. Uh, it may be that uh, you don't know what's on your credit report, so uh, it could be that some other person yeah. has taken those, uh, that information. All right. They're, they're, they're really helpful hints. That's something actually, the credit thing I might have thought about, but that other thing about the bill is very, very good insight. Uh, Rick, let's turn to one of the things. I mean, the, uh, Dave, Dave brought up the problem, you know, credit cards, credit cards, credit cards, credit cards. We're you know, continuing to use them, using them very heavily. There's some real warnings. I mean, using them properly is good. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's an important part of the way we do business, but the improper use of it uh, is, is not. Talk a little bit about that. Um, sure, Terry. You hit, the, you hit the nail on the head. A proper use of a credit card. Uh, it, it can be a great tool to monitor your expenses or to control your spending. Obviously, you want to be careful where you're using your plastic. You want to deal with vendors that you know are reputable. We all like to do some of our heavy-duty shopping um, um, uh, online. Make sure that when you're entering the credit card information, whether you're booking airline tickets or a hotel stay or just making a purchase, mm -hmm. make sure you're on a secure site. Look for the HTTPS um, in the web address to make sure you're on a secure, uh, uh, make, uh, on a secure site. And again, uh, reliable vendors. If you, if you aren't sure whom you're dealing with, whether online or in person, uh, it might be a good idea not to use the plastic um, if you can. Yeah, and, you know, there are all kinds of fraud. I mean... The types of fraud seem seem to be growing. I mean, there's these old, you know, phishing and the Trojan horse virus. We talked about the, some of those before, but talk a little bit more. Tell us a little bit more about w what our viewers ought to be alert to when it comes to the types of fraud. Types of fraud. Uh, I mean, it can be anything from uh, where you use your credit card. Again, on the credit cards, but on the plastic. Uh, if you're swiping it. Uh, if you let it out of your sight at a, at a restaurant, uh, there are sk skimming devices that could be used by, the, by a staff person uh, so they can take the information that's on that strip and be able to use that to duplicate it, replicate it, uh, and, and you get your card back, you think nothing's wrong. So I mean, that's another uh, possible example. Yeah. But. 
So it's just not stolen cards. I mean, almost, you know, if we, if we have them stolen, I mean, we almost always know they're stolen or we lose them and you make the call and get them straightened out. But there's always this business where, you know, someone will come on the Internet, they'll email you about uh, some kind of a deal, and then you use your credit card for it without knowing whether they're reputable. How... That that's pretty hard to figure out. Always, is it just beware all the time? I mean, it, it, what it's, would you it's, it, right, Terry. It's beware all the time. Uh, it comes back to the old adage: if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. So when you get that piece of email that you've won the lottery, yeah. I, I guess what should really alert a consumer: if by email or some other source, someone approaches you and asks for personal identifying information, in particular your social security number, do not give that information up until you yeah. have thoroughly checked out that yeah. vendor or that entity. Yeah, I mean, I'm even reluctant, you know, I'll get all, you, you'll do these emails and, they'll, and, and it'll be from a reputable company that I already know, that I recognize, that I've even might, even might have dealt, business, dealt with before, and the, the com they get up to that social security part. I'll just I'll just kind of say I just don't want to do that. I just don't want to give my social security number out. I mean mm -hmm. that comes to this. Sure. Is that the is that probably of all the ways that we can be the victims of fraud is getting the social security number one of the key elements? Name, address, social security number, birth date, uh, mother's maiden name. These are all things that yeah. might be used to obtain credit in in someone else's name. Uh, I think the biggest thing to, to bring out is what they can do to protect themselves and they can get the, the legislation passed a number of years ago with yeah. getting a free annual credit report. Yep. You can yeah. get one of those yep. uh, from uh, three times a year actually by going to each credit bureau, uh, the Experian, TransUnion and Equifax. Right. Each one is required to give you a free credit report uh, throughout the year. So right. you apply that. So every four yep. months you're monitoring that. Yeah, we have about a, a minute left, uh, Rick, but let me, it's part of the problem that you know, with credit cards anyway, there is kind of a limit to what we're in, you know, our, our public exposure. Do you think that has made it easier for people not to be too concerned about the credit cards? The, no, the, the, the liability know. rules and the built-in consumer protection, I, th I think you're raising a good point, Terry. There is a bit of a double-edged sword. The consumer should know a credit card is inherently safe because the Visa and MasterCard yeah. network rules have zero liability rules. So in the lost, stolen context, um, uh, there's no liability there, and that's a good thing. That enhances commerce. So again, it's really protecting the, the, the personal information, the actual theft of a social number. That's the real pernicious type of identity theft that leads to more significant problems. G great update, guys. We'll see you next week for another edition of Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and stay well.